My next guest is Frankie Mendoza. He is the Dean of Culture and Restorative Justice Coordinator at IDEA Public Schools in Austin, Texas. IDEA started as an after-school academy. His campus is in his 13th consecutive, 13th consecutive year of sending 100% of his seniors to college. IDEA has a no excuses philosophy. Students can exceed, succeed and achieve great things no matter what neighborhood they're in. He's been in his current school since 2016. His prior roles were teacher, alternative high school AP, and dropout prevention specialist. Thanks for being on the podcast, Frankie. Thank you so much for having me, I'm excited. So tell me about your experiences as a youngster in school and how that led into you getting into education and how that shapes your current work with students. Yeah, so my, um, my upbringing in education was, was a struggle. I struggled academically. Uh, I didn't have a lot of learning tools and a lot of, um, you know, inspiration when I was a kid. Uh, I was lost in the system at a very, very early age. Uh, until my parents finally saw the academic struggles when the grades came home. Mm -hmm. um, and so the school that I went to was a uh, just a small um, town in San Marcos, Texas. We had a small district and it was not, we didn't have that many options. So you went to the school where you lived at. So in third grade, I really started struggling a lot, um, but I had perfect attendance. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those kids that kind of, um, you know, I stayed quiet. I was there every day. So I was respectful to teachers. And so I learned that just being to school, being present was able to pass me and, and continue to, to grow uh, in my learning. But when the grades came in and testing anxiety started happening, mm -hmm. uh, my mother started to see a decline in my grades as well as the teachers. Um, and then um, the school tried their best. Uh, they didn't have a lot of resources for my family because my, my mom, she worked three jobs and my dad was in and out of jobs. And so I didn't have that full family support at home. So it really depended on the school. Mm -hmm. And our school was, was pretty big at, at um, that year when in third grade. And then, um, then I finally uh, failed. You know, my mom kept me back because of the struggle and the age didn't, didn't match up with the year. So mm -hmm. the school and my mom had a had a meeting and um, I re clearly remember that day when we got our report cards, our third grade year, and my dad was a bus driver. Uh, my dad um, had an awesome job as a district bus driver. So I was able to catch a ride with my dad and, and things like that. And so I remember being the only kid on that bus that didn't receive my report card. Um, everyone had the report card. They were excited that they were being promoted to the next grade. Um, and I walked up and my dad was like, hey, where's your report card? Yeah. I said, uh, I didn't get one. I don't know why I didn't get one. And at that moment, my dad kind of knew why I didn't get a report card. He was mm -hmm. like, well, mom was going to talk. Mom's going to talk to you at the house. And so at that point, I didn't know. I wasn't educated on how far behind I was. Mm -hmm. My parents didn't educate it with me. They kind of kept everything secret of my um, learning disability. You know, my mom was that powerful Latina woman that never, never showed, um, didn't want to put me down, didn't want to say, hey, Frankie, you, you, you're, you're a little behind. She didn't say that. She always kept hope. She always kept passion in my heart, in my learning. Um, but I found out that I felt third grade. And at that moment, I, I knew that school was going to be hard for me. Yeah. Uh, fourth grade came. It was a struggle. And then I got placed my sixth grade year and I got placed my eighth grade year. I had to attend summer school every year since third grade that year that mm -hmm. I failed just to pass to the next grade. So just imagine having to go to summer school, depending on your passing rate in summer just to pass mm -hmm. to the next grade. So I was always that kid that lived on the borderline of pass or fail. Uh, yeah. I always had to work extra hard. Um, and then I started, you know, get, showing symptoms of dyslexia and ADD and things like that. And, and at that moment, my parents didn't want to put me in that category, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, my district was saying, hey, um, Frankie's sped, Frankie's sped. And, being the Latina woman that my mom, you know, didn't know anything about the education system when she heard SPED, you know, to her, it was more like my kid is not going to be labeled that way. Mm -hmm. So they tried their best to kind of keep me afloat. Um, and then in ninth grade, it started getting real rocky. Um, I started having symptoms of wanting to drop out. Uh, don't know if this system's for me. Um, and then uh, I got into little, you know, street trouble in my neighborhood. I hung out. I had cousins that came from out of town. 
from Salt Lake, UD, Salt Lake City, Utah, and they were an inspiration to me. I wanted to be like them. My dad mm -hmm. wanted me to be like them. Uh, my dad came from, um, you know, the streets as well. You know, he was in his little, you know, clubs and stuff in, in school. And my dad quit the ninth grade year. My mom quit her senior year. So um, I didn't come. I didn't come equipped with the tools at home. And so um, I got into theater my ninth grade year. Mm -hmm. I finally found theater as as a um, as a way to express myself. I felt like an intervention, but that's not why I got into theater. I got into theater because it was an easy credit. Yeah. I learned in the school system that I'll take an easy credit to get the grades. I get passed. I'm there. So I already I already knew how the system worked at my district. Yeah. If if you weren't a bad kid, you kept quiet, and you were there every single day. The teacher was going to pass you. Yeah. Didn't mean, you know, the system, you know, that the district didn't matter if I was learning something or if I was going to use that towards life because I was already labeled as that kid that was unlikely to barely graduate high school and to go to college. College, college wasn't even a discussion when mm -hmm. I came around my mm -hmm. teachers um, wow. because I was just that kid. Um, and then theater saved my life. I got into theater um, by the directions of Mr. Daryl Fleming. Mm -hmm. He is now a retired uh, theater uh, teacher, but now he's, he got rehired out of uh, retirement. Uh, school got lucky enough to get Daryl Fleming, and he was a white guy. Mm -hmm. He was a white guy. They didn't look like me. Um, I was the only Latino in theater, I remember, my ninth grade year. And I remember going into the class, and I said, are you Fleming? Mm -hmm. He goes, yes, <laughs> you must be, what was your name? I said, Francisco Mendoza and I uh -huh. already, you, you knew that was me because I'm the only Spanish name on your roster. <laughs> yeah. So don't, don't play that game with me. Yeah. And he laughed, he giggled, uh, and he was like, all right, we'll have a seat. And I remembered specifically telling him, don't call on me. Uh -huh. I'll be here every day. I won't cause any trouble. Um, I'm just here for my C. I'm here for an easy grade because I heard it was easy. Yeah. And I remember he never really bothered me until I started showing up a little early because he was working on sets and I thought that was so cool that, you know, he was building things after school. Uh, and then I started kind of, you know, um, hanging out with the wrong crew in the weekends at home. So I lived this double life, right? As yeah. this cool getting along with the teacher. But at, at night I was hanging out with my friends, stealing bikes, spray painting houses, breaking in certain things, uh, breaking in vehicles, little, little things like that. And, and I lived that double life. Um, but I had loving parents um, until Mr. Fleming said, hey, um, it became, you know, it came very um, natural to me to be on stage and act like someone. And I remember yeah. him telling me, you know, when you go up on stage, that's not you. You know that, right? That's, that's another character. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he was like, it's, it's, it's not you. No one sees you. You get this script and you read it and you act like somebody else. And mm -hmm. I said, so you mean I can act like an uncle, I can act like a teacher, I can act like a student. He yeah. was like, yes, yes. And you know what? The beauty of theater, uh, Frankie, is you're never wrong. Mm -hmm. No one knows this character but you. And at that moment, I said, you know what? I'm going to go up on stage and act like the people that I looked up to. My drunk uncle, mm -hmm. um, my, my cousins that didn't attend school, and he would share stories of what he did playing hooky or yeah. skipping yeah. class. And that really satisfied me. Yeah. That really satisfied me. And long story short, Mr. Fleming said they are offering scholarships for high school students to go to college. I think you should, um, you should try out. And I said, no, that's not me. My counselor already told me and my mom that I was not going to college. So Mr. Fleming, you can count that out. Um, so no. And, um, and I remember Fleming goes, well, your senior year, what I want to do is I want to make an all- Hispanic Latino cast. This mm -hmm. has never been done wow. at our at our campus. And would you be willing to play the lead role? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. He showed me the script. It was the Roosters. It was the Roosters. It was a Hispanic written um, um, play, mm -hmm. and he wanted me to play the main character, which is Gallo. And you know, I was nervous because he said that the character never leaves stage. He's there for two and a half hours on stage. So that means you are in character for two and a half hours. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and, and already you're looking for a student that had ADD, dyslexia, uh -huh. that has, has horrible memorization, <laughs> uh, cannot learn, struggled in math. And so um, he worked with me. 
uh -huh. he, uh, he cut some lines out so it kind of filtered my learning. And I'll never forget what he was doing. He was accommodating to my learning, accommodating to the, to the relationship that he wanted me to show others. Yeah. Um, and then I be, got into the play. Uh, I got um, Honorable um, Best Actor Award. I got a, so many accolades and supporting actor. I did UILs. Um, I did a lot of supporting. I had received a lot of UIL uh, trophies and awards. And so my senior year, he was like, we're taking a drive. I've been in Dallas on a weekend and they're offering scholarship. All these, all the thespians here are going to audition. I think you should go. Uh -huh. And I remember I took that trip to Dallas. My mom thought I was crazy. And she was like, there is no way they give scholarships to people like us. Yeah. But Frankie, just go for the ride. Just mm -hmm. go whatever. And I remember going and sure enough, I got about 25 callbacks for universities, junior colleges. Um, of course, my GPA was sitting at like at a 2.3, 2.2. Mm -hmm. It was so low because I just wanted to get by until one junior college took a chance on me. Um, and so they took a chance on me and gave me a full ride uh, for acting. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved it. And from then on, I got into theater and theater has always been a part of me for, who, for being a theatrical. And then I went to Texas State, mm -hmm. transferred, came back home went to Texas State. I joined an awesome organization called Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, which is the first black collegiate fraternity uh, founded in December 4th, 1906. So shout out to all my alphas out there. Uh, they are what kind of helped me stay focused of being a minority, a student of color, mm -hmm. of saying you can also own your heritage and own the pieces of, of the, the better making of men and still get educated and yeah. still push and push and push. And so they kept me accountable um, and they will always be forever in my heart and I'm always going to be an alpha to the day that I die. Um, and so they helped me get into education um, because um, we started going to... Um, community service mm -hmm. and we started giving back to the youth and then I just found I saw little Frankie's all the way around I saw my dad in certain community service events and then I started subbing at an elementary actually my elementary that I went to mm -hmm. um, Crockett Elementary in San Marcos Texas and I started uh, subbing I started subbing and I started seeing the joy of these kids when I started doing theater with them and then that's when I kind of started you know feeling the the, the call of that teaching was a stage. Mm -hmm. Teaching was this theatrical, you're on stage, you got the mic, you got the audience. Either you can have the audience join you um, or you're gonna have to flip the script and go to the next scene. And so I became real good at that. Um, and then I started teaching in 2006 fully as a full-time teacher uh, at Gary Job Course Center. It's an alternative mm -hmm. education for students between ages and 16 to 24. And I got hired as a reading teacher to teach uh, a lot of the 16 to 24 young adults how to read, how to have the basic skills. And so the test that they had to take was the, um, the test, it's called TABE, which is the test, Texas Assessment for Basic Education, Adult Basic Education. And so I found the love of teaching them the thing that I really enjoyed it is because I was able to relate to them. A lot of our, or a lot of the students were there for a second chance. Uh, they, you know, want someone to go to college, someone to go to trade, some wanted to, this is their last chance. Uh, and it was more of a second chance uh, organization that really helped those in need that really wanted to make a difference. And the stories they sent, and I, that was when Ka Hurricane Katrina happened around that time. And we had a lot of students coming in. Um, from from Louisiana and so I had a joy to see different varieties and diversity in my classroom and I loved it and since 2006 I've been teaching um, and I got married to my wonderful wife um, we had two beautiful kids um, and then I became uh, an, a high school assistant principal uh, for mm -hmm. an alternative organization as well and I've been in education ever since and my goal is I didn't I graduated from Texas State University uh, with my theater degree and I went got my master's for adult basic education for uh, community education and I found the love for restorative justice uh, I've been teaching uh, like you said mentioned since 2016 idea public schools they have been a huge blessing to me because mm -hmm. um, they are that organization that holds no bars there's no excuses it doesn't matter where you come from what side of tracks you live in how you look whatever be how behind you are, how ahead you are, but we are going to send you to college. 
And I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of it so much that I broke the cycle of being a first generation college student. And I said, I would never go back into my old ways, but what I can do is go back for those that need help and bring them into this college journey that I so happen and fortunate to experience. And my kids are ideas, public school students. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm able to see them grow every single day because I know they have phenomenal teachers because I push myself as a teacher. Um, and then I've been in education ever since. I've, I've, I've gained numerous awards at Idea Public Schools for one of the highest reading, um, reading um, direct instruction intervention scores for, for um, my organization. I became teacher of the year. I've, I've been a master teacher for going on three years now. Now I'm the Dean of Culture because we really need to focus on the relationship with our scholars. If Mr. Fleming did, could not relate to me, if Mr. Fleming was not able to not just teach me, mm -hmm. but to get to know me, um, I would not be here giving this testimony and my journey to you and to the world and to others uh, like me on why I became an educator. It's, it's, it's personal. I'm passionate about it. Um, and so I use that mentality of uh, being told no all these years and I changed it into a positive and nothing's stopping me and there's plenty of educators like me that share the same the same um, struggle and journey mm -hmm. in school mm -hmm. and we've made a pledge we've made an oath to say we're going to go back and help those um, and then restorative justice happens to be a practice that I fully believe in. Mm -hmm. So if you were to say one single person brought you out of the trenches that would be that Mr. Fleming? It would be a Daryl Fleming. I, I I always say if I ever wrote a book, because that's one of my goals is to write a book of, of my journey and why mm -hmm. I became an educator. I think one of the first things would be that book would be, I, I will definitely say it would start out for, for Daryl. Uh -huh. I think um, he was one of those guys that took a chance on me. I will never, never forget him. Um, and it was in the beauty of this world, and especially what we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. He didn't look like me. Um, and, and so I want to always forever be grateful for, for uh, a teacher like Daryl Fleming. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I'm able to pass that on because there's plenty of students that I've saved, dropouts that I've saved to get their high school diploma, to get their trade, to get a job. Mm -hmm. And they look at me as a Daryl Fleming. So, um, you know, I, I don't never take that for granted. I think the best thing is to do is always go back from scratch, always go back to those reminders on what got you there and, and um, never take for granted for the blessings that God has given you, and whether it be a great job, whether it be great money, salary, a position, mm -hmm. um, because God knows you by name. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing that, that I'm able to recognize that Daryl Fleming is will be always, always be a, a part of uh, my journey. That's so great to hear. And we talked a lot about in the pre-chat about restorative mm -hmm. justice. And mm -hmm. you talked um, a little bit already about how you got into um, Idea Public Schools. And yeah. in, in 2016, uh, you started working with restorative justice. It took a little mm -hmm. bit of time to get off the yes. ground. But talk to me a little bit how, how you found your niche with that and also how, when the shift happened at your campus. Yeah, so I really started getting into restorative justice uh, really fully, fully in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I seen the practice here and there. I, and now that I'm in the trenches of it with, with the practice, I know restorative justice was used on me. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't know what it was. You know, of course, back then they probably, excuse me, they, they didn't call it a restorative. They just said, hey, Frankie, we're going to circle up with you and your mom, or we're going to circle up with you and the guy that you got in a fight with, or, yeah. or you and this teacher that, that thinks that you're an awesome student, but you say no, because they told you the other day that you, you were stupid or something. Um, so it was, I know, I definitely, for, I know that it was used on me, but in 2015, I really started getting pushed about it. I really started researching, um, and then I joined an organization in 2015, uh, shout out to uh, Austin Achieve Public Schools uh, and um, in Austin, Texas. They were the first um, campus to implement a full-blown restorative justice program. I'll be forever grateful for those leaders in that in that campus because they they pushed me to say, "Hey, this is what restorative justice is. This is the way we use it. Uh, let's dive deeper into this." And I was I was blessed to have a position where I can fully focus on the restorative approach in that organization. Um, and then Austin, um, and then Idea Public Schools, uh, because it was a lot closer to home, opened up. I, I knew about Idea because I applied to Idea when they first 
arrived in Austin, Texas. Um, and so I wanted to, to get on that, um, that, that wave of 100% to college, no excuses. Um, and so I wanted to, to grow with them. And then um, all of a sudden, 2016, I had my opportunity to, to join them. I kept in good contact with uh, some of the recruiters, the talent, some of the principals that, I've, that, I, uh, that I networked with. And they gave a good word to the principal in 2015-ish, 16, because the campus hadn't opened up yet. And I remember going into the interview and I said, hey, um, I would love this opportunity to, to implement restorative practice, restorative justice on the campus. And for it being so new idea, you know, of course the principal was able to be so open, so supportive. Uh, shout out to uh, Deanna Bruce is the founding principal in 2016 of Idea Bluff Springs College Prep. Uh, she allowed me to say, you know what, Frankie, you know, it's, it, let's try it, let's do it. I, I fully believe in the practice. Um, I like what you're saying. Let's do it. Um, and let's get these kids to college. Um, and so we started in 2016. Of course, we couldn't start as a full blown restorative justice because starting a new campus at every idea public school, you can only um, have the, the basics, which is yeah. the English teacher, the science teacher and the math teacher and the counselor and things like that. So I had to teach um, in which I fully fully i'll never take it back that's probably the best experience was a decoding class was direct instruction class um they said hey you can teach the small groups and when you can you can have your circles and i did that for a year and then all of a sudden the next year i said hey um let's let's do a full-blown restorative uh justice uh position because wow. it's a need you know it's, yeah. it's a need for relationships because we started seeing behavior issues in class uh, we, we had a system, an RTI system, a behavior system, but we didn't have that relationship piece, uh, you know, which frustrated, you know, some students, frustrated parents, um, you know, teachers, because we definitely want to save great teachers and we do have great teachers at IDEA. But the second year came around and, and we were, we were going to try it again. And so I taught a decoding class again and I did the same thing like the other year. Uh, and then it was slow moves. I started doing it after school. I started doing it at lunch. And then uh, I got a homeroom. I said, hey, um, one of our teachers had, um, had went to another organization and the principal came up to me and she goes, I have a challenge for you. I need someone to oversee this homeroom. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, okay, so, you know, what do we need to do? Like, well, you just need to be a homeroom. And, and then it clicked. She says, do restorative justice. That is your restorative justice homeroom have circles, do whatever you can, but this is you. You wanted it, you got it, let's go. And so I remember taking that homeroom and we did circles all the time. We did them in the mornings, we did them after school when there was an issue, whether it's stealing or, or, or maybe there was a cursing or about to be a fight, students wanted to circle. Students said, let's circle up, let's circle up, circle up. So we were doing that. And I'm proud to say we did that for one year because I focused on that homeroom. I was still teaching, but um, I only had morning check-ins I had lunch check-ins and I had after-school check-ins. Um, and I'm happy to say that all those 38 kids that were in my homeroom, 35, I'm sorry, 35, they all came back the next year. Like I, my homeroom was the only one that came back. Uh -huh. We had, uh, and the homeroom that I had was an intervention homeroom. Uh -huh. So these are all the kids that were reading two years behind of their grades. Um, they were struggling in math. Their data exit tickets were, were the lowest. But man, when we started relating to each other and we started calling each other out and holding each other accountable, talking about what happened and who was affected and why did it happen and what's the plan to make it better, we started slowly seeing the rise in academics. Mm -hmm. Teachers, the teacher that was already saying, man, you got a tough homeroom, they started changing. They started saying, did you know that your homeroom had one of the highest exit tickets than the other homeroom like really and I would take a snapshot of all those I would get my camera out and take a picture of their scores and I would take a picture of uh one of my scholars had a you know maybe he was it was a hard time for him to take make a 70 and you know he would have a 70 and the teacher would text me and she's like Mendoza your kid or the kiddo uh that struggled he made a 70 and I would go run and I would take a picture of him show it to his parents and we would circle up about that 70 cool. you know what happened who was affected how did you feel about that and man, it was so awesome to see, and they have, and you know, bad kids that, you know, all, like me, 
always had perfect attendance. Uh-huh. So they never had they never had bad attendance, and they loved coming because of circles. They wanted to talk it out. They wanted to talk life. Um, they all came back. Parent surveys came out, and I got one of I think I had like 97, 98 percent of positive parent surveys uh-huh. because I was talking to parents. I was talking to parents on where their kid was at, uh, where they're going, how they improved, and uh, I'll never forget that experience. Um, and then the third year came around. And I, I, became, um, I became a great team lead, and I was able to do restorative justice just a little bit more, maybe like 20% more. Mm-hmm. Um, I had still had small group, but then I still started doing it here and there, but we, I was still pushing for a full-time position. And of course, every year it was turned down, every year it was turned down, budgets and things like that, because you know, it's never been heard of with the organization. You know, Idea Public Schools, you know, they're, they're, they love developing these great, awesome roles, which is great for kids, but it was that piece I, I felt was missing on our campus and the need was, was, in, um, was needed for a role of culture or restorative, something like that, that way it fully focuses on that. Mm-hmm. And the fourth year, which is this year, um, we had um, the principal pull me out of class one day and she goes, hey, um, let's do this restorative thing. And I said, okay, but I'm teaching. And she goes, I'll take you out of teaching. Someone's gonna to cover your class, but I have this one eighth grade cohort and they're a tough cohort. Mm-hmm. Can you work some restorative, like, I just need you to go full time on this. And I kid you not, it took me two months mm-hmm. to work with these kids. We didn't suspend anybody because we implemented a restorative justice program where they would enter the room, they would reflect, they would still do their homework, they would still do their work. Teachers were coming to visit them. We were building relationships. And within two months before COVID happened, um, their behavior had just outstanding results. Teachers were like, oh my gosh, I just told them, I just told that student to have a seat and they thought for a minute and they had a seat. Oh my gosh, what, what just happened? And so they started seeing slow moves of improvement. And guess what? When that, when that improved, data started rising. Academic stuff started happening. And between the month and a half started going, the principal goes, hey, we see a huge improvement in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Can you do that for this other grade? And I said, yeah, go ahead and give me that grade. And so we started doing that. What I would do is I would implement pop-ins. I would implement check-ins. We had a behavior system where, uh, where if a scholar got a deduction, their name would, would have like, there would name highlight in our system and I would go pop in there. Because if you had two deductions, you can be assigned um, after school or restorative justice program. Um, and so when, when their name got highlighted every day for the, the first time, I would pop in there and I would do a restorative conversation with the students mm-hmm. and said, hey, let's talk about this deduction. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about who was affected. And those small conversations really allowed the students to look at their data to say, oh my gosh, you saw my deduction at one o'clock and the data shows that in the morning I had an awesome day and it showed the data showed at one o'clock they started getting those deductions and well guess what one o'clock that teacher and him or her had a tough relationship right they had a tough relationship so we were able to circle up with the teacher and the student started repairing of course repair and restorative practice doesn't happen overnight it's Mm -hmm. slow moves it's like a slow bake i call it because it takes time to bake something you got to wait and be patient about it and teachers really really loved it teachers have always been supportive of the restorative justice um, and then now this coming up here, I am going to be the first Dean of Culture for Idea Bubs Public Schools. It's going to be full blown focusing on culture, behavior, restorative practice. So it took me going on my fifth year yeah. to, to fully say it's happening. Mm-hmm. I'm excited because I'm excited where our campus, our campus is going to be an A campus next year. And I fully believe that because of the culture that we're going to put in place and tools for teachers. It's not just me going to be doing circles. Teachers are going to be doing circles. They're going to be having those restorative justice stems. And, um, and I'm just so excited. And this is going to change the game to a lot of campuses uh, for IDEA. And my goal is to implement a restorative or, or a dean of culture for every campus in Austin, Texas, um, for every campus, because teachers are happier when, when you got someone fully focusing on behavior and restore and reflective uh, opportunities. Administrators are happy because now they get to coach their teachers. They're able to look at instruction to help them and you have one person that is fully focused on culture and behavior and talking to parents and 
and saving kids from being suspended and expelled. I think that's very important that these kids can never say, oh, the school's just labeling me. They just want me to be in trouble. No, there's no getting away from it. You're going to restore it. And, um, and we're going to help you with that. So that's some of my, uh, um, on how the restorative approach started coming to idea. And so, yeah, so that's, that's where it was, that's where it is. Yeah. And you, you basically wrote the position. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's funny that you asked because throughout the four years I started collecting my own data. I was uh -huh. like, okay, what, what works, you know, this works given a deduction, but the deduction has no comment. Oh man, a kid just got a deduction with no comment. We need to put comments on these deductions mm -hmm. because it's important for these kids to see what was written. And so I started late in collecting all that data and, and I experimented on a couple of students and scholars that were some tough, you know, scholars on behavior and they started improving. And that's when I started collecting all this data. So when it, when it came down to um, writing the position, it wasn't hard because I lived it and I, and I, and I, and I was it. And I remember talking to my principal and I said, Hey, the position is what you are. You are the position, Frankie, uh, <laughs> what you've done for these, for these years, put that on a one pager and let's yeah. talk about it. Let's reflect about it. Of course there's approval that has to be, but I think what really helped was, um, was my follow up on the restorative uh, pilots because mm -hmm. um, what I would do is every time I would have a circle with teachers, I, um, I would have surveys for that teacher to fill out on how was your experience in circle? What did you learn from it? Uh, what, do you, what do you think about your next steps? Um, what could be added to the circle? And I started doing those, those surveys and I started looking at those and I started showing the leaders. I'm like, look, teachers want it. Look, this teacher is happier. Look, this teacher's, wasn't this teacher last week saying that she did not have the joy and she didn't like being here and this is not what she got hired for. And look, her deductions have gone down and she loves circles, she loves reflections. And then, then it really clicked like, oh my gosh. I mean, we talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. but when you see data, true life data and you show leadership goes, uh, it, that's when it really said, you know what? You know, and there's plenty of people like me. There's plenty of people that want to make the change and teachers make the change. We just need to, as leaders, sit still, give it a chance. Um, and, and I wouldn't say take advantage because that's a tough word, but, but use your talents of your staff. Yeah. I, I think if you fully invest in your, in your staff's careers, your, your, your staff's passion um, and their quality and, and quantity, the things that they do that they're passionate about and they fully invest in it. What, what organize what staff member would love that? I mean, I think with, with this happening, showing the data, but yeah, I just long story short, I, it was just one of those positions that I put down and it got approved. And so I'm excited about it. And the principal's excited about it. We are excited about it. And, um, and the students are very excited about it because they know how passionate I am on restorative justice. Um, they love, I'm a teacher. I believe me, I love teaching, but they knew that if a behavior happened in my classroom, Mr. Mendoza is going to circle up with you. Mr. Mendoza, and it is no, it's not rocket science, right? I, I always had the highest rating in student relationship. I always had the highest rating in parent surveys because of the restorative approach. So if we want teachers to be, you know, um, be able to teach and do what they love and you give them those, those restorative uh, practice trainings, um, yeah, this campus, uh, any campus could, could benefit from that. I think that's a great approach because you've truly been a teacher leader in your building and in implementing the restorative practices and, and helping teachers become better teachers. And um, you talked to me a little bit in the pre-chat also about some of the accolades you hold on campus and uh, some of the courses that you've been mm -hmm. teaching the past year, just like Abbott and Road to and Through College. Can you talk a little yes. bit about those? Yeah, so this past year I was honored to be a Road to and Through College teacher. Uh, every campus, every IDEA campus has a road to and through college one, two, three, and four, all through their high school years. Mm -hmm. um, it, is a, it is a course to um, fully focus on college readiness, uh, college application, GPA, scholarships, community service. And so I was honored to teach my ninth graders this past year. And those were the founders, right? Those were the kids that I started with in sixth grade. So it's amazing how when I started with them in sixth grade and now I'm able to teach them in ninth grade year about college. Um, it was just one of those moments where it's like, oh my gosh, 2016, 
I, I saw them as sixth graders talking about college, college, college. Now I'm actually teaching them in ninth grade about college. And so it really it was a huge eye opener for me personally, because now the time is coming where we're now fully focusing on the road to and through college. So it is a course that's required. Um, it teaches uh, scholars what community service is about, how to write a paper, how to get critiqued. Um, and so in doing presentations, so it's really college driven. Um, it's, it's avid, right? It's, it's a college prep um, curriculum. And so I had the honor to, to teach the curriculum as well as put my spin of my personal stories. Like I'll give you an example. If I'm talking about uh, the admission process, um, I like to kind of put my personal uh, twist into it where it's like um, I would teach about the admission. I was showing videos about this is what the admission process looks like. You got all these professors looking at an application and they're looking at hundreds hundreds and they got to make a choice what is going to how how are you going to get their attention and when i tie in my personal experience when i said hey i remember being in front of an academic representative at, at texas state and they looked at my ninth grade grades and they said so you want to be a teacher yeah uh yes but your english grade you ninth grade year you made an f talk to me about that and so when I share those stories with them, they're like, oh my gosh, Mendoza, you were called out like that? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So that's why it's a huge eye opener. And, and it's personal when I, when I teach these courses because I've lived it, I've done it. I, I've been at the table where they say you're not good enough. And I've had papers ripped and thrown, thrown at me saying this is not good enough, do it again. So when I teach these classes, um, it, was, it was puzzling. It was, it was awesome. It just fit right into my personal life and, and that's what got them engaged. Um, I would share stories about my mom talking to a counselor or the time I had to go talk to a counselor or a professor in an office. I couldn't just show up at their office. What does the appointment look like? Mm -hmm. Like what does an email look like? You know, when you send an email, you're not sending it to the professor, you're actually sending it to the clerk yeah. that has to check it, has to look at his calendar, it has to see when his availability. So now you're dealing with patients right but you want quick answers right you can easily ask me how do you how do i do this project but but just teaching them the 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 things that happen in college mm -hmm. uh what what free scholarships out there so that's what i talked uh, taught at road to and through college but i became a master teacher real quickly at austin at, at idea um public schools because of my high um, reading scores for direct instruction for teaching our, our students uh for small group i got i i did that for you know, I'd had it for three years and then I became a trainer for teachers. A trainer for teachers for IDEA is, um, is a trainer that teaches new teachers um, how to be an effective direct instruction teacher. So I had the honor to train new teachers how to uh, teach a reading class, reading intervention, uh, what does data look like, what are some of the things that you can improve in, how do you calculate the data, how do you implement joy in intervention classes because you need to know that in intervention classes, students when students get to know that it's a class that um that they're trying to improve themselves and they're a little behind it can be a little uh a little tough yeah. so i wanted to make sure and, and we all do it idea is we have so much joy in our direct instruction classes because students are already walking in class like this right they're like they already know they're behind but guess what when you walk into a direct instruction class uh you see all these joy you see you see pictures of 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 the teachers, you know, personal life, a graduation gown hanging, mm -hmm. um, incentives, maybe an incentive can be like an ice cream party once you hit like 15 lessons and um, a balloon party or a drawing party, a movie time, things yeah. like that. So, um, you know, my job was to help uh, train that. And, um, and there you go again, right? I share my personal story of me being behind, right? Here you go for a student that was far behind in academics, uh, a teacher that was told that in third grade that I had to fall back. I was placed in sixth grade. I was placed in eighth. I, I was at risk. And here you go, a teacher that gets a master teacher in, the, in, in reading intervention. Not one year, not two years, three years. What type of passionate story is that, right? Like when sitting and sitting, you know, as a young kid, never knew it. I hated school when I was young because I hated it because I didn't know it. And so, um, and here you go on becoming an educator, um, going on 14 years in education. Uh, love the classroom because, like I said, I implemented theater with that. Um, 
and then now I'm able to to lead others on culture and relationships and I think I think God has given me this journey to to realize you know that I had to go through that I think every uh, every mistake is supposed to happen for a reason so that way you're able to learn from it and never go back there again but our job is to go back and help help others in, in the same way mm -hmm. As we wrap up this podcast, what is the most important thing you'd like listeners to remember from your story and how you got to where you are now? Right. Um, I, I really think um, being vulnerable is important to being an educator. Mm -hmm. A lot of our students just see the outskirts of everything. They see a, a teacher maybe in a dress. They see a guy in a suit or a tie. That's what they see. Mm -hmm. But um, be vulnerable, be, be able to, to be honest with them. Share your story of your struggle on why you became a teacher. Mm -hmm. A lot of people forget about their story. They forget about what brought them. I think the most important thing is process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to have all these degrees. It's great to be an educator. It's great to have a doctorate. It's great to be a teacher of the year, the master teacher. But I guarantee you all the students that I have taught knew my struggle, knew that I cried, knew that I had hardworking mom, but my dad was in and out of jobs here and there. I didn't have inspiration um, a lot when I was a kid. I hung around with the wrong crowd. Um, so when you share your personal stories, whether it be alcohol, right? If you want to go in depth uh, mm -hmm. to say, hey, you think I'm great and everything, but man, I, you know, I was an alcoholic, you know, uh, I, I struggled. Uh, I was fired at every job that I had. Um, but I think the why and, and their story is the most important thing. Once you have that, um, students believe you, students know you, and, and that's the only way, um, you can actually get through a student to me, to be honest, because, um, Nowadays, it's telling kids what to do. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And you already know what, what happens, especially with our generation. Yeah. You have to relate to them. Everyone has a story. Um, the power of a story is so huge on why, um, on why I became a teacher. Um, and that's for me personally, is just to tell your story. You know, um, a lot of people have a problem with, 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 um, with that, you know, being vulnerable to do it. But I would say slowly move, mm -hmm. you know, share here and there. Maybe have a picture of your family up in your classroom. Um, maybe bring your wife, maybe bring your husband to class and just, you know, have, have lunch with your kids and go to your, go to their community, have, play basketball with them, play football with them, you know, go to quinceañeras. Um, but don't be afraid to jump out of your professionalism box because we're all human. We're not perfect. Uh, I would rather meet a student at a store and knowing that I could be my, my total self. Mm -hmm. And they're not just going to see Mendoza as the one that just wears a tie. You know, that's Mendoza because he's a first generation. That's Mendoza that um, he didn't always have it perfect. And that's Mendoza. He's a master teacher and, I, I, and, and he relate. And my mom knows him or my dad knows him. Uh -huh. Who wouldn't want that as, as, as a student? I would, if I would have had me when I was young, I, you know, but Mr. Fleming was that me. Mm -hmm. uh, just a totally different approach, but uh, I would probably leave with that. Uh, just be you, be, be happy, be joyful. And I think reminders, you know, reflecting in minds like when a, when a teacher is having a hard time of like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? I think you need to surround yourself around positive people mm -hmm. that are, that are, um, that are going to push you. Uh, there's three types of people that you really, really want to be around. This is what I, this is what I say. And um, you really want to be around the people that are um, maybe not as fortunate as you are. Maybe that in the profession world, they probably don't have as much experience as you are, but your job is to mentor them. Your job is to bring them up. And the second person is the one just like you, the one that you're able to compete with and challenge and talk about your, your, your awards and joy and your hurts and your pains and, and, and be that one person. But the other one is the most important. That's the one you wanna be like. Mm -hmm. That's the one that you want to get to. I think everybody needs to look at someone and to be vulnerable to say, you know what, I want to be like that guy, or I want to be like that girl, or, you know, or man, that'll be awesome to have that. Like, but, but, but be vulnerable to go ask them, how did you do that? Like how? I think being honest and, and telling your story is going to be going to allow you to go up to someone and say, 
how do you do that? Please tell me what you did because I want to do it and I want to learn what book are you reading. I want to read that book. What, what seminar did you go to? I want to go to that seminar and, and just put that pride down and just go. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I would be able to, to leave with that. No, I think those are great words of advice and great parting words for educators. And self-reflection is a huge um, tool for educators to use. Yes. We don't do that enough. So if uh, listeners want to reach out to you, how can they get in touch with you? So they can reach out to uh, Francisco um, dot Mendoza one at idea public schools dot org. Uh, or you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Frank, just type in Frankie Mendoza Austin LinkedIn and you'll see uh, I post a lot of great, um, great videos. I also have a YouTube channel, uh, Frankie Mendoza dot uh, MA or Masters of Arts. So if you go on YouTube and you click in Frankie Mendoza, you'll be able to to see that, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, they can find me on YouTube, LinkedIn, shoot me an email, um, and you can connect me with any time. I am open to talking at schools, um, maybe talking to teachers, maybe implementing that want to implement practice at schools to say, hey, what you're doing at, at Bluff Springs, that's something that I would like to try. You know, can you share some of your data and some of your practices? Uh, I'm open to talking to principals as well. I've talked to three principals so far this summer, which is awesome. That I'm able to share my journey and my story. And when I ask the three principals, I'm like, do you have a staff like that? They're like, oh my gosh, I have a staff ready to go right now. And I can't believe I wasn't letting him use his passion and his talent or use her passion and his talent. I got to jump on that. So it, sometimes it just takes one, um, but that's how they can connect with me. Um, and so, yeah, just feel free to, to reach out. Well, thank you so much for being my guest on the Out of the Trenches podcast. Most definitely. Thank you so much for having me.